Good morning. It's nice to be here. As was mentioned, this Wednesday we're going to have a uh, family fellowship. Uh, our one in December was canceled, and, and uh, it was happened after the Christmas program, so if you can think that far back, you want to share some things regarding that, uh, let me encourage you to think about that. Again, tonight, if I didn't, uh, weren't known, you're welcome to come over to our house around 6.30 or so, and we're going to go over some slides for our trip to Ecuador, so we'll just have a time of fellowship around that, and uh, you're welcome to do that, so that'd be nice. You can take your Bibles this morning, you can open them toward the back of the Bible, the epistle of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. Last few weeks we've been kind of looking at a phrase called having an eye in eternity. We've used that as a backdrop for some various truths that we've been looking at, and we're going to continue in that same vein today. The admonishment to live in light of eternity has always been a directive uh, for those who know Christ as their Savior. Uh, but the reality of that perspective seems to come more acutely into focus when the temporal circumstances of life um, are less than one would want. And, uh, and that's important because having an eye and eternity for the believer in Christ is crucial to fulfilling the will of God uh, for the child of God and the remaining time on earth. It's really the only way to view your life but it's not uncommon because of various factors to need to be admonished to that end. And, uh, and usually for most of us, and I know it's true for me, that I become more acutely focused on the eternal when the difficulties and distractions of life come into my life and then disrupt it to some degree and, uh, and inconvenience me to some degree. And, and we look at the world as a whole, and we can see that it's moving in that direction. You know, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a perfect and great hope in Christ, and that is to be the foundation and the motivation uh, for the rest of your time here on earth. And, uh, and that's supposed to be true whether everything's just roses or everything's the opposite. We're to live in hope, but that hope that we have in Christ can be easily overshadowed through our own personal struggles. And that's why we need to have our thinking recalibrated as we come together and we learn the Word of God and study it. And it's never a bad thing to be reminded of what the future holds for the believer in Christ, and that's really designed to be our focus, and that helps us perceive and be aware of, of how to look at the life that we're trafficking in on a daily basis. We, a couple weeks ago, looked at the verse in Ephesians 5.16, which said, Make the most of your time, the most of your opportunities in time, because the days are evil. And again, the foundation of that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have a hope of glory. We're going to talk about that. God's goal for you and me as we track her through life is to be viewed with an eye in eternity, dominated by this reality and the other promises of God that are ours because we're in Jesus Christ. And because this is true, we saw last time, we are not to lose heart. And Paul had every reason circumstantially, whether physical, whether spiritual, all kinds, to say, you know what, I've had enough. But he never did because he recognized through his eye fixed on eternity and fixing his eyes on what is not seen that his afflictions, though on a human level were very great, he considered light because of the weight of impact and difference it would make on the other side of this life and glory. And so we're not to lose heart, even though difficulties abound. You know, difficulties abound in life for various reasons. Some are due to the poor decisions we make. Um, some are thrust upon us. Some through no fault of our own. And some because we choose to do the right thing in the face of a world that is hostile toward Christ. That's really what Moses' difficulty was associated with. He made a choice, though he had the world by the tail, to suffer affliction with the people of God, doing the right thing, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Because he had the right perspective. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches treasured in Egypt. And that's a battle we all fight on a daily basis. 
even when it comes to planning our lives. Why? He looked at something. He looked at the future reward and says, you know what? It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. And the key to it all was seeing him who is invisible. And that's the key to it in our lives. Seeing that Christ is who he is, what he's promised is true, and what awaits us is going to be worth it all when we see Christ. That's the beauty of it. And so if we're not looking to Christ and seeing him as invisible, we're going to struggle to a greater degree than we need to as we walk through this earth. And another thing we need to keep in mind is, is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty means he is providential. He is directing. He is overseeing and undertaking. And he's making all things work together for good. Even the evils and wrongs of others and all the other cruelties of this sin-infested world. God is overseeing all of it. He said, Jesus said, well, I'm going to go through this really quick. But in his last thing he said to his disciples before he prayed for them in John 17, he says, in this world you will have trouble, but he said, take heart. I've overcome the world. That's how it has to be. We need to take heart. You know, God is a God of love, and he can't love you any more than he already does, and that should encourage all of us. Nothing can separate you from that love. You know, at times believers tell me, you know, I just don't feel that love, and you might not always feel it. I mean, that's the reality. But the, that doesn't change the fact that it's real. In fact, a verse that encourages me often. Said to the nation of Israel, I've loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I've continued my faithfulness to you. God can't stop being who he is, and he loves you always. It's a dependable love. You know, someone in your life might have promised to love you, and yet hasn't continued to that, and yet God will always continue to love you. He can't do that. Human love is not an everlasting love. But God doesn't love you like other people may or may not. He loves you in a way that will never let go. And it's not because you're lovable. And I trust you're thankful for that, because it was predicated on you being lovable. You'd be out in the cold, literally, and figuratively. No, that love never fails. It's because of God's amazing grace. And it's because of that grace and God's perfect plan for you and for me and because of the victory Christ won, what we need to endure here in time doesn't have to be in vain. And the unbeliever doesn't share that hope. They've got nothing to look forward to. You know, regardless of your difficulty and what might even be coming down the pike, we can rest assured that our afflictions are light compared to the weight of glory that God wants to accomplish in them and through them in time. And that's a perspective you need to wholeheartedly embrace because life could turn on its head at any time. And one of the things the eye and eternity is supposed to do is to recognize, like it did with Apostle Paul, that getting saved from sin's penalty is never to be an end in itself. You are still here. God has not called you home. And so there is something left for you to do. There's something that he wants to accomplish in you and through you. And we're going to look at one of those things today here in 1 John. 1 John 3 says, Behold. And so you have to stop and behold. When you see that, that's a command. Behold. So stop and think. What am I supposed to stop and think about? What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God? That's a good place to start, wouldn't you say? You know, having an eye in turn includes beholding God's amazing love for you. That you and me, that you and I, rather, would be called children of God. You know, God's love is amazing in every way. It's the epitome of what is complete, thorough, and perfect. And the beauty of it is it's unconditional. In no way, shape, or form are we worthy of this love, nor could we be. You know, we cannot claim to be entitled to anything from God, especially his love, based on anything that we've done or who we are in and of ourselves. In fact, if you would approach God on that basis, hoping he would love you, he wouldn't love you at all, because you're just not worthy of it. You know, the burden of trying to earn something for God is insurmountable, and there's so many people stuck today in that very trap, and it's just sad. See, that approach to God's never been on the table. The just shall live by faith. In fact, everyone who seeks to approach God on that basis has every reason to be condemned here this morning. Why? Because what they really are 
approaching God with is something he doesn't want, and what they're earning from God is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's never asking you to approach him on what you have done. He wants you to stop and consider what he has done for you in the person of the Savior. You know, people think good works can pay for sins. All of good works are like filthy rags. Imagine trying to earn someone's love with a pile of filthy menstrual rags. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Here, I love you. Let me show you. Oh, no thanks. And the problem is, is that good works can't pay for sin, and that's something that the natural mind doesn't readily conceive. When we bring our good works to God, it's bringing like a dumpster and said, here, Lord, I've got a dumpster for you. And he says, you know what, that smells, thank you, and I can't take it. See, the issue that separates mankind from God is sin, and good works don't pay for sin. Like monopoly when he can't buy you something at the store. They have to be paid for, and some will have to pay the price for your sins. And the question every individual needs eventually to come to grips with is, will it be you or, or Jesus? See, Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because he owed a debt we could not pay. We could not pay it. There's nothing we could do it. And he didn't have to pay it, but he chose to pay it because he's a God of love. And Romans 5, 8 makes that clear, very clear. God demonstrates his own love. It's his love and none other. And we're the object of that love. It's toward us, though we were unworthy. We were still sinners. Christ chose to die for us. And that's the epitome of God's love because of what that death accomplished for you and me. Because that love caused him to be punished for something you and I did. Amazing. God punished his own son in our place. That's the good news of the gospel. At that cross of Calvary, your sins and my sins were laid upon him. And he willingly and lovingly said, I'll pick up the tab. Jesus was at the cross enduring what we deserved in our place. And that's a message that needs to be understood thoroughly. It's not Christ enduring this horrific penalty for sin plus us doing our part. He did it all. That's why it was predicted in Isaiah 53 regarding Christ. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And it's through his stripes, not his stripes plus yours, but his, we are healed. Thankfully, on that cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished, which means paid in full. And so, in communicating to the gospel, you remind people that on that cross, Jesus personally called up your list of sins from the day you were born to the day you would die, and he paid for them in full. That's love. And understanding and embracing this means you hop off your efforts to have God love you and get saved and jump on Jesus Christ and him alone. But when it comes to grace, and grace being efficacious in your life and mine, you need to get out of the way. You cannot accept God's grace for your life until you let go of your own righteousness. You have to humble yourself and say, you know what, I don't have a snowball's chance. I need Jesus Christ and him alone. So the way is wide open for everybody. The issue is, will you take it? And people need to take it. And I trust people are going to be open to this message. And it's our privilege to share it with them. But the one simple response is, will you accept what he did for you by simple faith in what he did and nothing else? That's it. You know, the unsaved don't have that hope. This is why the unsaved have friends named Jim and Jack, as in Jim Beam and Jack Daniels, because they can't, they're trying to find a hope in something and it's just not, it's just not happening. You know, all mankind has a void. There's a void, and they're either trying to squash it or they're trying to fill it with something that can't get it done because only Christ can do it. It's amazing. But what manner of love for the believer that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God? John can hardly contain himself. But as a child of God, everything changed in your life from the standpoint of your position on earth. You now became an alien and a stranger on earth. Your citizenship was transferred to heaven. And that's his next point. Having an eye on eternity includes embracing the hope of eternal Christ likeness. Notice verse 2. Excuse me, the rest of verse 1. Therefore the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. That's why the world thinks you're an oddball. And yet they need the very message we're seeking to share. Verse 2. Beloved. Remember, we're so loved, we're a child of God. Now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know this, 
that when he, our Savior, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And so if I have an eye on eternity, what I'm focusing on is, and embracing is the hope of my Christ-likeness for all eternity. No more pain, no more sorrow, frustration, difficulty, agony, none of it. See, you have a perfect hope in Christ, though it's not yet realized. And that's the whole point of a hope. Hope is something that's guaranteed to come to pass, though it's not realized now. See, biblically, hope is a glad, it's anticipated, it's an assurance of something that will take place. It's not a roll of the dice. And this is, did you notice that John said in verse 2 here? But we know that when he's revealed. He didn't say, you know, we're hoping, we're, we got better, we got a 50-50 chance. We roll the dice, we think it might happen. No, it says we know. 100% based on the sure promise of God and the testimony of Jesus himself. And so we don't have to speculate about this, but we recognize that we have to wait for it because it hasn't been realized. And what we're looking forward to is an instantaneous transformation. Paul said it this way to the Corinthians, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, boy, the words come up three times already, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep is a synonym for physical death for the believer. But we're all going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in a nanosecond, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we, Paul assuming that it would happen in his lifetime, will be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This more mortal must put on immortality. Well, I can't wait. Hmm. Paul said it this way in Philippians. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await, thank you. See, when you think of hope and living for the Savior, eagerly await is part of the equation. That's the mindset. And we're eagerly awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control is going to transform these lowly bodies. And they're going to be like his glorious body. Hey, hey, hey. Jesus is our hope. No, nothing can take that way. In fact, Romans 5.5 5 says this hope does not put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Again, a reminder that the unsaved have no hope. They have no confident expectation of the future. There's no certainty. They've been promised no blessing. Ephesians 2 says they're without God in the world. And every hope they have is suspect. It's like walking on thin ice. You just don't know when it's going to collapse and when you're going to break through. And many are totally oblivious to the reality of eternal hell. Now, we need to know that this transformation is imminent. The appearance of our Savior is imminent. Imminent. It could happen at any moment. Imminency means, as it relates to Bible prophecy, that the return of Jesus Christ for the church can happen at any moment. And this is a thread that runs through the New Testament. The New Testament believers say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Our Lord comes quickly. And that transformation is going to take place. We are, as we think of the plan of the ages here, Christ came and rose. We are in the church age, and this church age will come to an end during the rapture, which could happen at any moment. And I'm guessing we're closer to here than we are here. And I'm grateful for that. But it could happen at any moment. As soon as the trump sounds, and I love it, there'll be a voice, and something, the voice is going to say, come up here, and we're going to go, pew, and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. I like what John 14 says, he's going to receive us unto himself. He's not going to send an angel, he's going to say, hey, I'm coming for you, because I love you, and you belong to me. And that's the way it is. And it's imminent. It could happen at any time. And so how is this truth designed to affect how you and I think? And it is designed to affect how you and I think. It's not just something that's there. It's designed to have an impact on your thinking. And that's what verse 3 is all about. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself. Excuse me. Hope in him purifies himself just to see he is pure. So having an eye on eternity means fixating on our present position in Christ and our future hope 
which again includes him in return. And it's to motivate you to grow in holiness now. That's always how God has designed this thing to do. See, when you got saved, God put a yearning in your soul to honor your Savior. He put a yearning in your soul to want him more than anything. But that yearning needs to be responded to. There's a yearning in your soul to honor your Savior. You became a new creation in Christ. You've got a new identity. You have a new home. You've been given a new perspective, a new reason for living, and a new objective in living. John says, again, verse 3, everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, John wasn't the only one to say this. This is what Peter said. After listing in the first 12 verses all the wonderful riches and and we have, what we have to look for in Christ, he says, therefore, and he gives the first command in the epistle. Engage your brain, that's the, what this phrase means. Gird up the loins of your mind, turn your brain on, be sober and rest your hope. Hope is the confident assurance and glad anticipation of Christ's return fully upon the grace that's gonna be brought to you. Here it is at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's that, what's that, how is that supposed to affect you? Well, as obedient children, not conform yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance when you didn't know any better. But since he who called you is holy, you also be, it means become, holy in your conduct because it's written, become holy for I am holy. It's designed to affect your personal walk in life with him. That's what it's designed to do. God's goal for you in time is holiness and purity. And the cool thing about it is, is God's grace provides the motivation and the means to see it happen. And that's so important. It's all about God's grace and seeing this done. It's not about you cranking this baby out. It's about you responding to your Savior. Because, and we can go here now, go to the book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus says the same thing. Or Paul said the same thing to Titus, rather. Titus, chapter 2. I have it up here. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worthy lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, as we what? Look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Starts with God's grace, ends with God's grace, as we look to Jesus Christ. And we can note some things here. The first thing, having an eye on eternity recognizes and acknowledges that God's grace has saved us. Verse 11 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace resulted in Christ becoming a man so that all men can be saved. Now, don't misunderstand this. The grace that saves has appeared to all men, which means all men are savable, but it doesn't mean all men are saved. Everyone has to make their own personal choice as to what they think of Jesus Christ and whether they trust in him or not. But the grace has appeared so that all men could save because Christ died for all. But every individual has to make a choice to accept him. Those who, by the grace of God, put their trust in Christ will go to heaven, and those who do not will spend eternity separated from him in hell. That's the reality. But all are savable because Christ died for all. And since you're still here and I'm still here, grace is still working. And that same grace that saves any and all, it's the same grace that God wants to currently use in your life and mine so that we become holy increasingly before him. See, grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace means that God showers favor and blessing on those who do not in any way deserve it or earn it. And that's the beauty of it. God's not asking you to be worthy. He's asking you to appropriate what he has provided in love that has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you at all. And so having an eye on eternity includes believing that grace trains us and appropriating that grace that trains us is the idea. Because in verse 11, notice, he's, in verse 11 he says, 
he mentions all men, but then in verse 12, he changes it to teaching us, us who have believed on Christ and received this grace for salvation. It teaches us something. The word teaching there is Greek word pedeo, and it actually is used in the terms of training up a child or disciplining a child. So the word teaching there could be translated training. Grace is what trains us, it teaches us, it instructs us, it corrects us, it disciplines us. All in the process of God's goal and time of making you more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his goal for you, that's his goal for me. And grace trains us to what? To deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And then grace trains us that. You know, legalism doesn't do that. Adopting a moral code doesn't do that. Grace does. Now, grace is not designed to, for you to just hang loose and live sloppy and do whatever you feel like doing. It never trains you to do that, though grace allows you to do that. And there's a difference. Grace certainly allows you to do that. It doesn't train you to satisfy your own selfish desires and waste your life. That's missing the point of God's grace and time for the believer in Christ. Again, grace is freely given. It's not earned. It's an ample supply. It never runs out. It's always sufficient. And that's why, as believers, we exploit it. And I trust you recognize that you exploit the grace of God. It's not why it was given, but since it's never-ending supply, it's easy to exploit in some ways. But God gave it so we could do the will of God for his glory in time. And so God's grace is to train us and discipline and instruct us in godly living for the glory of God. In fact, it's the only means by which you can do that. And John told us that the objective, positionally, of every believer in Christ changes the moment he gets saved. It's not about me anymore, it's about my Savior. And my greatest objective in time is to see him honored and glorified and to do his will. Because we have the mind of Christ, and Christ said, I came to do the will of my Father. That's it. But pure grace has a way of getting polluted from two different sides. You know, grace runs contrary to the world system. The world system has a worthiness component to it that says, you know what, if you're gonna get ahead, you gotta earn it. You know, you gotta get good grades, you gotta win rewards. You gotta work hard to make the team. And all those things are true. In fact, in the world, the opposite, if you don't perform, you're gonna get fired or whatever. You're gonna lose out. That's religion kind of in every realm. Religion says that you gotta do something to earn something from God. Grace says, no, you can't do it. Will you let me work in you and through you, thank you, so that I can accomplish it. So important to recognize. So important to recognize. And you don't perform to get grace. Grace is given as a gift. So one side of grace gets polluted when we throw our worthiness aspect in it. Well, I'm hoping God blesses me today because I, I didn't do the nasty nine or the filthy five. You're trying to earn something from God. Ain't gonna work. He doesn't bless on that basis. Now the other side of it is what Jude addressed here. There's certain men that crept in unawares who before of old were ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Hey, God's grace is sufficient, man. Let her go. <coughs> Let her go. Hey, hey, hey. You got a free pass to sin, man. Failing to see that sin always has a consequence. There's always a price to be paid. God's grace is designed to free us from the bondage of sin. And sometimes when you mention that, people think, well, you're a legalist. And sometimes you warn people, you know, if God loves you. And I said, like any parent, I said, if you know, if you wander and do foolish things in love, he's going to discipline you, but that's still all grace. But some just don't care. I'll take my chances. I'm going to live life on my terms, thank you. And God's grace is, you can do that. But you're going to wish you wouldn't at some point.
And there's always the critics of God's grace who say, well, you know, people teach that if you teach God's grace, they'll live as they please. And, you know, everyone's living as they please anyway. I don't get it. I mean, you're living as you please. The, the issue is, are you living in a way that honors the Lord? Because you're still in charge. You're still making your choices. Do you know, when it comes to your eternal destiny, since your salvation was never predicated on how you lived your life in the first place, it can't be conditioned to keep it and maintain it on how you live your life in the second tense. That's impossible. You know, I read a story this week that, and I've read it several times because every time I read it, I cry. And so I figured I've read it enough times, I won't cry. <laughs> to help you understand grace. The guy's name's Jeremy. I'm going to read the story. It's a little long, but bear with me. <clears throat> he said, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World would be so difficult, or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family, I, this is the dad writing, I'm sure that this couple had had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming our eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World. She had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades, but when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she'd always been the one left on the outside. Once I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World the next time a speaking engagement took our family to the southern United States, or southeastern United States. <coughs> I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotional instability. What I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her, mut her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before her family headed to Florida, I pulled out her daughter into my lap and talked through her latest escapade. I know what you're doing, <clears throat> excuse me. I know what you're going to do, she said flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but a downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She tried and failed that test several times before, so she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on Earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear into my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But, by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes, wide and tear-rimmed. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Well, then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family, and we're not leaving you behind. I like to say that her behaviors grew better after that moment, but they didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all along the way. Still, we headed to Disney World on that day, on the day we had promised, and it was typical Disney day, overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going someday again. <laughs> In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, a little weepy at times, but her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her and held her and said, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World. <sighs> but not because that was good, it's because I'm yours. That's grace. 
God says, you're mine. I love you. You can't out sin grace. Don't bother. It's not going to change how I feel about you. Outrageous grace isn't a favor you can achieve by being good. It's a gift you receive by being God's. Outrageous grace is God's goodness that comes looking for you when you have nothing but your middle finger flipped in the face of a God to offer in return. That's the motivation for becoming holy. If you want some legalistic motivation, go somewhere else and do something else. It's God's love. Why would you not snuggle up to that, to a Heavenly Father that only has your best in mind? I don't understand it. We belong to him, period. Nothing can separate us from his love. But that grace is designed to motivate you and get you to understand the purpose of that grace is not to dishonor your Savior, but to honor him. Just like the love these parents showed their adopted daughter was not for the purpose of her dishonoring them, but to flourish in that love. And God wants you to flourish in the security of his love. See, God has left you here so you can be conformed to the image of Christ. So in light of eternity, does it matter if you live for Jesus Christ? In terms of your destiny, obviously not. But in terms of what awaits you, not only there, but in time, it means the world. It means the world. You know, I'm so encouraged by truths like John 5, 24. Most assuredly say to you, who hears my word and believes in me, who sent me. Christ has right now everlasting life and shall not, future indicative in the Greek, you will not come into judgment, you passed perfect tense in the Greek from the realm of death to the realm of life. I can sleep at night knowing that my salvation is secure in Christ. I didn't blow it today. I'm not going to lose out on that reality. But on the other hand, there's so many admonishments to make your life count. You know, we're going to get to this eventually, Lord willing, if he doesn't come back. Peter said, sir, we left all in, Jesus, we, we've left all and followed you. And Jesus then said, yeah, and I say to you that no one that's a believer that has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels won't receive a hundredfold now in this time. Precious fellowship and internal joy with all kinds of suffering thrown in. You're going to receive houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Oh, wait a minute. A lot of ugliness. But it's going to be worth it all. You see Jesus. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Christ is very clear here. But if you're willing to give yourself up and live for me and the gospel, you're going to say it's going to be worth it all. What if you waste your life? See, this is why you've got to walk by faith. And this is why... The scriptures keep pointing us to the reality that we belong to Jesus and that it's going to be worth it all when we see him. You know, the difference we have in America is that historically people live through lousy circumstances. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the prospect of going to heaven and have everything beautiful was like, oh, I can't wait. But now, since I got my feet up and I'm smoking a stogie and, and you know, drinking a margarita... Hey, that's a facade. It's a waste. It's a joke. And Paul is telling Titus here that this grace, this amazing grace we have is designed to train us so we think right and redeem the time. You know, Satan is repeatedly trumping out the message. This temporal existence is all there is. You better milk it for all it's worth. Go for it. Spend your time fulfilling the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Where 1 John 2 says these things are not of the Father, and the world's passing away in the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Go through life so that you can sing like old blue eyes, I did it my way. And say, and stand before Christ in shame, according to 1 John 2.28. You know, 1 John 2.28 says, he says, abide me, little children. Because you're going to stand before Christ. You don't want to be ashamed that you ruined the opportunity of a lifetime wasting it on things that are going to go right down the toilet versus things that are going to matter for all eternity.
But this is where grace comes in. I'm out of whack here. See, so what does grace train us to do? If I'm having a love affair with Christ and basking in His grace, what's it going to do, verse 12? It's going to teach me, train me to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Deny ungodliness. What's ungodliness? It carries the idea of having no regard for God. It includes all that is done without taking God into account. This is what the unbeliever does. He's trying to find some purpose and meaning in climbing Mount Kimmel and Jaro. Yeah, I made it to the top. Okay, great. Now what? Well, I guess I've got to come up with the next game plan. Bothers me when people say, you know, I don't need God to have morals. Well, if there is no God, there is no morals, and who cares if you're moral or not? It doesn't matter. Boy, I tell you what. What else does it do? It trains you to deny worldly lusts. Worldly lusts are the things of the world which long for and are desired because of selfish pleasure and gratification derived therefrom. Every commercial you watch is centered in this very principle telling you, you got to have it, man. This is where it's at. If you get this, life will be good. You know, there used to be a billboard going up 169. Bud Light commercial, I forget what it was. And everyone's just having a grand old time, and I was witnessing to a guy who happened to have been a lifelong alcoholic. He said, they should put my picture up there and all the things I've ruined. That's what Bud Light does. But the billboard says, no, it's where the good times are. Nothing wrong with Bud Light. I prefer Pabst. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not the point. You know, Paul said the love of life constrained him. That's what grace does. It constrains you. You know, again, you've been made a new person in Christ. You've been given a new nature that yearns to honor him in every facet of your life. And that's the place of perfect peace. You ever notice when you're doing your own thing, you lack peace in your life? But I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to keep doing my own thing because peace is down there somewhere. It's not a piece of what you want. And God gave you the Holy Spirit to illumine your thinking and empower you with, with this grace so that your life can mean something and that's in the place of perfect peace. You know, we've seen, even if Paul says that the goal of, of his life, he said in 2 Corinthians 5, was knowing I'm going to stand before Christ, my goal is to please him. Colossians 1.10 says, that the goal of life is to please Him. And nothing actually pleases you more than pleasing Him. And nothing sucks the life out of you more, ultimately, than exploiting the grace of God. You know, the issue in living the Christian life is the same as when you got saved. When you got saved, you completely trusted Christ to do something for you that you couldn't do for yourself. When you live the Christian life, you're walking in dependence upon Christ who can do something for you that you can't do for yourself. You're consciously depending upon Him. Apart from grace of God, you, know, you have no chance for victory over that sin nature. You know what I like about this verse? It says, it says the grace of God trains us. It doesn't say the grace of God is dependent upon our obedience. Now, the grace of God trains you so that by His grace and Him working in you and through you, you can be obedient. It doesn't say that grace can be achieved through obedience. See, the issue is God's grace is, gives you everything you need to see the will of God done. slides are all out of order, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing here. 
I like what this guy said. I think I got it from Strombeck, but I'm not sure. The discipline of grace brings to mind and soul the goodness and beauty of God, its unfailing love, and its all-inclusive provision. When the heart sees the goodness of God and the riches of his grace, the pleasures, preferment, honor, and wealth of the world lose their glamour. We sing that song, the things of the world go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. See, it depends what you're focusing on. They are seen as temporal in contrast to the eternal values of God. You know, the world is always trying to make it about you. It appeals to your selfishness, your pride, seeking after status and power and greed and lust and living for simple pressures rather than simply enjoying who you are in Christ and Him. I mean, eternal life is about knowing Jesus Christ. Psalm 1611 says, In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Why are you trying to find a cheap substitute that's going to beg you to come back time and time again? See, Satan comes as an angel of light and promises something that he never delivers. The same lie that he gave Eve. Hey, if you eat this, you'll be like God. God's not going to kill you. Come on. He'll come out okay. You'll come out on top. In fact, you'll get ahead in disobeying God. No, okay. You know, when you stop and think about what God has saved you from in eternal hell, which is nothing but perpetual torment, isn't that enough? Isn't that enough to set your affections on things above where Christ is and to set your mind there? See, the work of grace creates that attitude. The work of grace sustains that attitude. God begrudges you nothing, but he wants you to look at life through the lens of, you belong to me now, and I love you, and I am your security, I'm your all in all. If you want a joyful life, then just have a love affair with me, and I'll work in you and through you, and you'll see the ungodliness for what it is, and you'll see the worldly lust for what they are, and your life will count You know, one of Satan's big lies, you know, it does say there's pleasure in sin for a season. It says that in Hebrews chapter 11. But it's only a season. And the season isn't long. And it's always at a great price. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And you're not the exception. Oh, yes, I am. Sooner or later, sin always ruins and disappoints. But you see, this is designed, verse 12, teaching us to deny in godliness and worldly lust that we should soberly, righteously, and godly. Notice, in this present age, during the time that we have, the time that we have. So what's the positives? The positives, it teaches us to live soberly. If I'm viewing my life through the lens of grace, the word soberly means sound in mind, purpose, and judgment. It's not yielding to the various passions and impulses. It's synonymous with the last fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. It's going to see things for what they really are and respond appropriately. The second word there is righteously, doing which is right before God. The grace of God encourages you not to let her go, but it also encourages and provides so that which is right and honors God comes out. Doing that which is right before God and man it refers to life and integrity and brightness before God in your dealings with others. It means conforming to God's standards of conduct as real the commandments of His Word. And it teaches you to be godly, displaying the character of God with a humble regard for God. Isn't it great that the grace of God not only teaches us not only to what to deny, but also what to embrace? A godly life that redeems the time. As I walk in dependence upon him. And the beauty of it is, is again, according to Philippians 2, 12 and 13, it's him working in you both to well and do of his good pleasure. You need to seek his face according to Colossians 3 and yield your heart according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And God works in there. To that end, giving you the energy, desire, 
to honor him and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. But there's one more component to this. Grace trains us so that these qualities are realized when we eagerly wait for the imminent return of our Savior. See, the sentence continues in verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Present participle. So the grace of God is going to be working in and through me to deny what the world is selling, to embrace what's important to God. But I do that with an end in view. With an end in view. This is called redeeming the time. J. Hampton Keithley, who I appreciate all his labor. He's with the Lord, but he said, having mentioned this present and temporary age, the apostle quickly moved to the age to come, which will be ushered in with the glorious appearing of our Savior. And that could happen today. This is to be another strong motivation to godly living, a fact that is even more obvious in the text. See, the word looking there isn't the word like gazing. It's actually the word as we eagerly wait, present tense, eagerly wait. You know, going back to the illustration, you think that, first of all, that, that's, that girl wasn't sure she'd ever get there because of past history. But in her heart of hearts, she was eagerly waiting to get there. And she got there. And it was joy and explicable for a child, eight-year-old child. And that Spirit of God wants to duplicate that same mindset for us, but not for magic kingdom for Christ. You have to take this by faith, but I think because of the world we live in and because of other factors, we do fully grasp how much Jesus loves us and how much he cares for us and what it's really going to be like when, we're, when we're, we are in his presence. I mean, it says in 1 Peter 1.8, you, you do this with joy inexpressible, full of... I can't remember exactly. Joy inexpressible. Do you have an expressible joy knowing that your absolute full completeness in Christ is that special? We've allowed the world and other things to taint our view of what's the real reality of who we are in Christ and what we have waiting for us. Satan's always offering a chief substitute. I mean, I still remember as a kid, heaven being projected through Satan as playing a harp on a cloud, I'm thinking, who wants to go there? I mean, oh good, I get to play a harp on a cloud. Jeez. Where do, where do I sign up? I'd rather have my toenails removed. No, I mean, that's such a lie. It's such a lie. He said we could easily trans he says, as we wait presents a translation of another adverbial participle that is dependent on the previous verb that we should live. So we should live according to grace as we wait. So we could translate it this way, by waiting expectantly for the happy fulfillment of our hope, literally the blessed hope. The blessed hope in scripture is the rapture. We have a hope that we die, we're gonna be in the presence of the Lord, absolutely the body's present Lord, but the blessed hope is to escape death and meet the Lord in the air. But notice, waiting expectantly for that happy fulfillment of our hope. The participle points us to one of the means by which we are to live in this present age, by living with a view to the return of Christ. Waiting for the blessed hope provides added incentives that enable us to live godly lives in the present age. Why do we need these incentives? You know why? Because we live in a world that is diametrically opposed to Christ. Where if you live for Christ, it's going to cost you something. It's, it might, who knows what it could cost you? I mean, look at the list we looked at last week with Paul. The list was enormous. Most of us wouldn't have survived. And yet he called it a light affliction 
and he wasn't going to lose heart because he believed and he knew, and he was privileged to have some special revelation because he went to heaven once and came back. But he says, you know what? It's not worthy of being compared. Now, do you believe that? If you believe that, instead of chomping at the bit to go fulfill some lust of the flesh in time and try to define your time here on earth, you know, like the one guy, I made it to all the Super Bowls. Wow. <laughs> you know, and that's how the unsafe function, they're looking for something to kind of trip their trigger and fulfill their, and that's Mickey Mouse. I can make this moment count. I can buy up the opportunity this time. And I can honor Jesus Christ even if my world stinks on every other realm, every other level, and every other way. He can't steal my hope in Christ. And I can have, I can love the unlovely like Christ loved me and have perfect peace in my heart. Even though someone might throw me the lions in doing it. This is how this is supposed to work. And again, I might in my mindset bemoan what my circumstances might turn into as life goes forward and, and things, the uncertainties that might even become certainties that are not good might happen, yet what do I have in Christ? It can't be stolen. It's mine. And I can redeem the time by honoring God with my life, by denying unworldliness or worldliness, lust and, and ungodliness and living soberly and righteously and godly in this present age because his grace has provided everything I need to do it. So why wouldn't I? And I get to reap the benefits of the fruit of the Spirit in my own heart, love, joy, peace, etc. But I'm to do it because what's more real to me than the circumstances I'm in is that Jesus could come today. He's coming back for me. And all this garbage is going to be gone and done with. It's only by the grace of God that these things can take place in your life and mine. Are you thankful for God's grace? We're going to talk about this more next time because there's a, a front side and a back side. And there's other implications to this. But just think of that story. The reason she got to go to Magic Kingdom wasn't because of her behavior. In fact, her behavior said there's no way you're going. It's because she was part of a family. And that's all that mattered. And that's the mindset going forward. Let's pray. Father, we're humbled once again as we consider the amazing grace of our Savior and what that is to mean to us day by day, individually, as we go through life. We thank you, Father, that the grace of God is sufficient for these things, that it's the very thing that trains us as we have our eyes on Christ to deny ungodliness and worry lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present age. Thank you that our Savior is coming. We know it could be today. I pray that we train ourselves by the grace of God to live in light of that reality. And that reality would be more real than the circumstances that surround us. We thank you for the word of God that gives us this hope. We just thank you, Father, for your grace and the Lord Jesus Christ making it all possible. Thank you for him who loved us with an everlasting love. And because of that, he'll be faithful to us till the end. And it's in his blessed name we pray. Amen.